Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Transitional Justice, and we are happy to have uh, Akin Bolahan uh, Adeniran. I think I got that right. Uh, he, he's from <laughs> he's from Nigeria, Abuja, Ni Nigeria. He's a lawyer, and he's going to talk to us about uh, complementarian justice. Is it complementarian things in general? Welcome to the yeah. show. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little about yourself. Um, you're with Project Expedite Justice, um, and you are doing what Project Expedite Justice does, and you're doing it from uh, Abuja, Nigeria, and you're a lawyer. And um, well, tell us, tell us about yourself, and so we can sort of uh, focus on what you do. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, so my name is Akin Golahon Adeniro. Uh, Many people call me Boye, that's my middle name. I work as the legal and program director at Project Expedite Justice. Uh, here in Nigeria, I used to be a state attorney general and commissioner for justice. Uh, it was a role that provided a platform for me to uh, implement people-centered justice projects. Uh, I have significant working experience as an investigator and a prosecutor, both with the United Nations and the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Uh, my previous work experience also includes advising the Nigerian Vice President on rule of law issues and supporting the implementation of justice sector reform projects in Lagos State. Uh, with Project Expedite Justice, um, I focus on empowering conflict-affected communities to seek justice and accountability. So for those out there who do not know about Project Expedite Justice, it's a US-based uh, nonprofit uh, with charitable status uh, that was founded in 2016 by Cynthia Tai. Uh, PJ's mission is to use all available legal options to seek justice for individuals who are inadequately protected under the law, cannot access legal resources, and are exploited by government, uh, corporations, and others. Uh, so that's me in a nutshell. Wow, I'm glad I asked. That's really valuable for us to understand. And I, I want to I say something that you didn't mention, but I think it's worthy of mention. You're a lawyer. You went to law school in Nigeria and also in the U.S. And when you went uh, to law school in the U.S., you, you were misled into going to Harvard. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think the institution would uh, like to hear that. I, I, I think I, I made a good choice in going to have. <laughs> I, I think so, too. So the answer is a question. I, I heard your answer about who you are, but the question is, why are you doing this? Um, OK, so. And I hope this doesn't sound cliche. Um, I actually was going to be an engineer. I, I, I was a science student in school. I, I even did uh, some pre-engineering uh, courses. And I, at some point, uh, decided to switch to law. It's kind of like a family profession. My mother and my father, they're both lawyers. And uh, in switching to law, one of the things I uh, that I that made the switch easy or the transition easier uh, was the fact that my overall goal, even for being an engineer, was kind of like to solve problems, to solve you know people's problems, uh, the the everyday uh, common problems that we normally find. And and as a lawyer, I get to do that as well. And uh, as a lawyer, the added bonus is I can switch. Uh, and focus on different uh, disciplines and different areas uh, of people's lives, uh, you know, whether it's medicine, engineering, construction work, uh, and now human rights. So it's been exciting being a lawyer and trying to just go to different areas uh, to solve people's problems. You could have stayed in the U.S. You could have got a job with a um, an NGO, a nonprofit in the U.S. You could have got a job on Wall Street, for that matter. Uh, <laughs> but, but you elected to go back to Nigeria. Why? 
Um, so initially, I actually elected to go work for the International Criminal Court, and it was that institution that I was in awe with because I found uh, I just considered it to be, you know, the first of its kind and a fantastic opportunity to to serve at that level. So I was actually the very first investigator, staff member working in the Office of Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And um, and I my my practice in law focuses more on public interest law. So you're right. I I I wasn't swayed by the you know the commercial you know law practice uh, you know on Wall Street. Uh, that's not my that's not my thing. And uh, this has been for me very fulfilling because I get to focus on people's problems, uh, the common man on the street, and we uh, like you know when I was uh, doing my introduction, I talked about working on people-centered justice projects, uh, and here. The idea is to look at what the average person on the street actually wants, uh, you know, trying to uh, make sure that the justice that is being delivered is justice that actually suits their needs, not something that someone uh, decided was appropriate without actually looking at what is needed. When we spoke earlier, you, uh, I asked you uh, whether you were operating and uh, working in countries other than Nigeria, and you mentioned you were working in a, a bunch of countries in the Horn of Africa, East Africa. Um, so what other countries are involved and what, what kind of work do you do as you move around from country to country? Yes, so my uh, focus is uh, South Sudan, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Uh, but Project Expedite Justice uh, has additional work in Ukraine and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the work we do really is we go to areas that are conflict affected. So it could, it could be ongoing conflict or it could be in the post conflict phase. And we try to empower local communities uh, to take action in order to bring justice, to address uh, the issues affecting them. And because we are empowering the local communities, we believe it's sustainable because they are the ones that care most about their countries. Um, and positive complementarity, which is a concept that we're going to be talking about, uh, is really a set of activities or actions um, get towards encouraging national proceedings in a country. And by national proceedings, I'm talking about investigation and prosecution you know, mass atrocity crimes, international crimes, and other serious offenses, so that the countries themselves are not waiting for an international body to assist them or to do the prosecution and investigation for them. Countries handle this business themselves. They have the capacity, and it's much more sustainable that way because if anything else should happen in future, that capacity is already built in and they're able to address the situation. So let me ask you some some larger questions to start, so I can get a, a handle. Um, so, what is the problem in your area of operation? Call it East East Africa, the Horn of Africa, uh, that that creates so much conflict. Um, I mean, to go into the origins of the conflict, I think uh, would be massively complicated uh, because we probably have to go back into uh, colonial or pre-colonial times. Um, but for whatever reason, um, there's a lot of conflict um, stemming sometimes is, uh, you know, ethnic in origin, uh, different ethnic groups uh, having issues, uh, whether it's um, in terms of fight for political resources, uh, natural resources, there's always something which is discussed that the different group is essentially uh, fighting for. And um, so in all the three countries, South Sudan, Sudan, and Ethiopia, it's different. And, and so I don't want to pretend to have, you know, one, uh, you know, one explanation that essentially cuts across uh, all three countries. Um, but these conflicts are a fact of life now. Um, and 
what we are trying to do as Project Expedite Justice is to seek ways to empower the human rights defenders, the civil society organizations, the non-governmental organizations, the private lawyers, uh, and some government entities like, for example, the national human rights uh, institutions in, in, in Ethiopia, for example. We're trying to empower them to take action so that when these crimes occur, there is or there can be an expectation of justice. So what is your your vision, your hope? Uh, what do you hope to achieve? Was, when, when is your job over? When is it no longer necessary to have you do what you do? Uh, what do you what are you hoping for in these countries? What's the, the you know the the status you would like to see the the vision of the future you would like to see? So Jay, I love that question. Um, and just to give you some background, when I used to work at the International Criminal Court, the prosecutor at the time, uh, Louis Moreno Campo. He used to say something that people just thought was, you know, profound. Uh, he would say that um, he would have accomplished his job if there was zero case before the court. Uh, so if he had no investigation or prosecution and if he was made redundant, that for him would be, you know, mission accomplished. And I think it's the same for me. I would say that uh, the day we have no more conflict uh they you know these um uh even in countries that have had conflict and these crimes have been addressed uh, so the conflict may have occurred maybe 20 years ago for example uh, but you now have uh proceedings national proceedings where there are active investigations and prosecutions to hold those who bear the greatest responsibility for the crimes that have occurred responsible um, I would say my job is done, and especially when that is being done at local level, where you have uh, credible proceedings that target those who are truly responsible for those crimes uh, going on. Uh, so, Bunye, yeah. um, you know, uh, how far along the trail are you? How close to that, you know, vision are you now? Is this something you think you will achieve or? you know, the community will achieve in your lifetime, in our lifetime? Jay, it's difficult to say. Um, I, I think these are issues that, uh, first of all, let me say that we have some very brave uh, individuals uh, working on these issues. Uh, some people uh, who are courageous enough to stand up, uh, even in the face of threats and, and extreme danger, uh, to stand up for what is right. And, and people who are willing to take up action to ensure that, uh, you know, the justice that they see is missing uh, is that there's something being done about it. Uh, and that said, um, we are in the thick of things at the moment uh, in the sense that there's a lot of injustice, there's a lot of conflict, there are a lot of crimes, and, and people are trying to bring action. So at this point in time, I think it's difficult to say whether I will be seeing uh, you know, my dream realized in my lifetime. Uh, I'm hoping, I'm a very optimistic person. I'm hoping that it will be, uh, but no guarantees. Mm. I'll tell you what my dream is. Would you care to know my dream? I, I want to know. Please my tell me. My dream is public safety, no, no, uh, you know, violence. My dream is uh, an economy for each of those countries and more uh, in sub Saharan Africa, uh, where people are happy making the money they make. They have a quality of life that is acceptable. They're not in poverty uh, and they have health care. Uh, and, and you start there and you work from there. Um, and I would like to see that. I, I believe that it's possible if people generally understand the value and the po possibility of achieving those things. Huh? Yeah, I, and I love that. You know, what you just said, so when you look at the Sustainable Development Goals uh, 2030, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, they mention similar ideals. It's as if you were just reading, uh, you know, from the SDGs. And um, these are ideals that we all aspire to. So in my other life, I try to help 
uh, you know, countries to implement people-centered justice projects or initiatives that help to guarantee equal access to justice for all uh, to the point that you can then start to seriously address the no violence in, in society ideal. Um, and then, of course, I believe once you have security and stability, then you can then focus on the social infrastructure like healthcare, education, and so on. A long way to go, but I think it's a it's a global the global vision, and hopefully there'll, there'll be some serious um, you know achievement over the next few years, not only in Africa but everywhere. Not wood, not wood. Um, so let's talk about uh, complementarity. Uh, you know, before I got the write up on this show uh, from you know uh, Project Expedite Justice, I don't think I'd ever heard that word before. And I went and I tried to look it up, actually, uh, and uh, I had a lot of trouble because there were various definitions, none of which really hit me. As far as I got was there, there are multiple things that are complementary, and the idea is to find the way to, to bring that complementary, complementarity together. That's as far as I got with it. Tell me more. Yes. So complementarity uh, is actually a word. Um, that was coined um, by the International Criminal Court or allied institutions. And the idea of complementarity, now we're not talking about positive complementarity, yeah, just complementarity, is that the ICC, International Criminal Court, is a court of last resort, uh, meaning that it offers complementary jurisdiction uh, to national uh, jurisdictions. So. The idea is that countries will be the first port of call in ensuring justice after mass atrocities. Uh, so it is only where the uh, countries are unwilling or unable uh, that the International Criminal Court will then uh, come to uh, deliver justice, so to speak. And so positive complementarity is now looking at it from a much more proactive stance that rather than wait uh, for the countries to just um, uh, have the jurisdiction, why don't we proactively try to also build capacity, uh, support those countries in developing that you know, capacity so that they can essentially investigate and prosecute uh, those crimes without waiting for an international institution. So is this the port of the system that exists in a given country, uh, or is it um, developing a system that somehow integrates with the system in that country? I mean, or is it both? It could be both. Uh, so if the country lacks uh, what uh, is needed, uh, it could the support could be to help develop you know that system. So for example, uh, some countries may not have the legislation to tackle international crimes because they haven't uh, domesticated or ratified the Rome Statute, which is a statute established in the International Criminal Court. Uh, but it could be that they also have the system, uh, but they, are, they, they lack the capacity. So it may be not unwillingness, but uh, the, um, the incapacity to actually implement or uh, operationalize the system that they have. So they need support in certain areas. It could be because uh, international crimes are massively complex. And so there might be technical support that is needed to focus on certain areas of investigation to develop capacity uh, so that the country will be able to address those issues. So can you give me um, an example, you know, down to the ground on, on how uh, positive complementarity might work. And can you give me an example of where it actually has worked? Okay, so let's talk about what Project Expedite Justice uh, does. And so Project Expedite Justice uh, would typically go to uh, countries uh, where uh, it's either in the post-conflict phase or sometimes ongoing conflict. I mean, uh, in Sudan, for example, uh, many will say that the conflict in Darfur is ongoing. Uh, and there is uh, emerge, an emerging conflict now in the Brunel state. And 
when Project Expedite Justice uh, identifies such countries, what we do is we also try to identify different actors uh, in the country that we believe are best placed to help the country to find uh, the right balance in terms of uh, being able to investigate and ensure justice, accountability for the crimes that have occurred. Uh, and so we'll typically uh, look for human rights defenders, uh, private lawyers, civil society organizations, uh, entities that have a background uh, doing this sort of work and that we know have a passion for it. And then we will look at their capacity because we, we focus on the very at the start of the process, which is the documentation, the investigation, collecting evidence as to what has happened, documenting it so that the accountability mechanism that will be utilized to address the criminality may come down the road. But, you know, even if you have an accountability mechanism, but then you don't have the evidence uh, collected, then that might be a problem. One of the issues that uh, institutions like the International Criminal Court face routinely is that sometimes they get there late. Uh, so maybe the crimes occurred uh, 10 years ago, and by the time the International Criminal Court is brought on board, you know, they're already, it's almost like, you know, a cold case. And, you know, they have to talk to witnesses about things that happened many, many years ago. And that can prove difficult in some instances. So what we are trying to do is to close that gap. Uh, we're trying to get uh, human rights defenders, uh, civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations to start collecting the evidence early while it's still fresh and to preserve it uh, for either their local systems, when their local systems develop to the point that it can entertain such, act, such actions, or for an international institution that may come later down the road, the UN might set up a tribunal, um, and, and that will be used to essentially address uh, the criminality. But once you've collected the evidence uh, in a way that meets international standards, and that is properly preserved, then it can be used at a later stage uh, by, uh, by different actors. You know, this, this raises a question in my mind as to, um, you know, what happens if there's a change? What I mean is, we, you are, the world is in a fast-moving environment with human rights and the prosecution of war crimes and, and all that. And um, various tri tribunals have various rules. It's not always the same. Uh, you'd like it to be uniform, but it may not be uniform, uh, and it may change. So, as you mentioned, sometimes you gather the evidence uh, in year one, but you don't actually get to a trial until year five or more or ten, whatever it may be. Okay, and in that period, uh, you know, you may find the rules of evidence change. You may find the rules of the court and presentation change. You may find the whole system has to some extent legally changed. How do you how do you set things up so that they are adaptable for that change? So luckily for us, uh, the international system uh, is not as dynamic as national systems. And so the change is not um, uh, is not one that occurs from year to year. I mean there have been some changes like for example the crime of aggression uh, is now one that can be prosecuted, uh, investigated and prosecuted at International Criminal Court. That means, uh, so invading, that, is, that means invading your neighbor. That's right. That's right. So that's, that's progress, right? But the rules of evidence and the rules of procedure um, before the International Criminal, Court, International Criminal Court has remained relatively stable. Um, and yes, the judges uh, can interpret the rules to make it more robust. Uh, they might narrow it in some cases, but the rules uh, generally they've remained uh, fairly the same, uh, you know, since uh, for about you know 15, 16 years now. I think almost 20 years, in fact. Uh, so that uh, level of uh, stability is there in the area of criminal law. Um, there are general principles that apply. Uh, one is that you cannot be uh, prosecuted for a crime that was not a crime at the time it was committed. 
Uh, so criminal law does not apply retrospectively or retroactively, uh, which means that there is certainty. At the time you're committing an offense, it must be an offense, and it must be a written offense. Uh, and so at least that offers people some protection. So when, even if that crime, the definition changes, uh, it won't apply to you retroactively, but you can still be tried for it uh, for the crime that was in force at the time it was committed, even if that crime has subsequently been redefined. And so um, I, I think for everyone uh, who has committed uh, mass atrocity crimes, I usually tell them that, look, your day in court will come. It might be 10 years down the line, it might be 20 years down the line, it might be 30 years down the line, but it will come. I'll give the example in uh, Rwanda. Uh, Felician Kabuga, I, I think, was on the run. He was a fugitive for about 23 years. And, I mean, he's an 80-something-year-old man. Uh, but he was caught, uh, I think, about two years ago in Paris. And now he's being prosecuted uh, in The Hague for uh, offenses committed during the Rwandan genocide. So by, by that, uh, even waiting years, decades, you hope to have um, what accountability, um, retribution, and deterrence. Uh, are all three of those concepts in play in a case where you wait 23 years? Yes. Um, so deterrence, yes. Uh, accountability, retribution, yes. And so uh, Hopefully the person stays alive long enough uh, to serve some prison time. Um, in the International Criminal Court, uh, there is the added um, uh, goal of reparation to victims. Mm -hmm. And so they have a trust fund uh, where once the court has declared uh, a set of people as they build them victims, the trust fund can essentially award, uh, or the, the court can mandate the trust fund to pay some damages uh, to them. And it will be administered in such a way as the court may essentially direct. Uh, it may be through, um, you know, building of schools or hospitals, uh, but essentially some form of uh, reparation goes back to those communities that are affected. Seems to me very important that those communities know that these proceedings, these investigations, proceedings, prosecutions are happening and are inevitable, uh, and that there, there's a price for a war criminal to pay. Because if they know that, uh, you know, then you, you're raising all the boats, so to speak. You're developing greater confidence in, in the system, in justice, uh, and in the government, and in PEJ, for that matter. Um, so uh, that is the investigators who come around and ask questions. They have greater uh, influence because people know what it's all about. Do they know? Yeah, so the the goal of international criminal justice is also to get the knowledge out there. So, you know, one of the complaints uh, you know, against the system is that, okay, the, the, the trials are happening in The Hague, uh, all the way in Europe. And, you know, the offenses were committed, say, in Democratic Republic of Congo uh, or in northern Uganda. Uh, and the people, main victims, uh, are oftentimes not as connected to the proceedings as people would want them to. Uh, but then there's work being done in that regard. I mean, one, they, uh, they try to set up centers, viewing centers where the trials can be followed. Uh, on a daily basis while it's happening. Of course, there's interpretation that's going on in case the language is one that is different from the language spoken in the country concerned. Uh, there are victims that are also represented at the court. So they actually go to the court. They're represented by a victim's representative, a lawyer, uh, that also presents their side of the problem uh, because the prosecutor may not address all the victim concerns. And therefore, their representative can present also additional issues before the court. And I think all of this, uh, you know, should all come together over time. 
And remember the principle of complementarity that I mentioned uh, as well, uh, which means that the idea is that the country itself should address the criminality. And of course, if it's doing so, then it means the proceedings are local. And so that's why that's the preferred system where the countries themselves um, are tackling the issues and because that justice is closer to the people, uh, it's felt uh, more uh, this way. And if we, uh, because in Project Expedite Justice, we look for different accountability mechanisms and you know some of them can be local, uh, some of them can be regional, like regional, I mean, within Africa as a continent, for example, for things happening uh, in Africa. And then international, like with the International Criminal Court or some UN bodies. Um, you know, one of the uh, things we're proud to mention as Project Expedite Justice is we had a case once uh, in, in Sudan where we were able to uh, redefine uh, open source evidence, the, uh, the the court found it to be admissible for the first time, and it was something that we assisted one of the partners that we work with uh, to make the argument uh, in court. And it's useful now because uh, you know lawyers in future can make the same argument. You know, in the legal profession, we believe so much in precedence, uh, and that precedent has been set which means that subsequently you can have people uh, making the arguments and, and using it to advance uh, you know, justice in their own cases. That's one of those changes I was thinking about. You know, the technology changes uh, and the law changes or the procedure uh, changes around the technology. But let me, let me uh, what I get from you is that, you, you know, you, you like to be able to deal with the individual countries uh, the in individual communities. Sometimes there are issues that involve a number of countries, regions, if you will. Um, and my my uh, reaction to what you're saying is that complementarity is is really something you have to look at country by country, region by region, because it involves the system in that country or region. You have to examine and evaluate that system as against other systems to be able to make the connection. Am I right? Yes, 100% correct. Um, it is focused on the particular country where the crime occurred. Uh, and you're looking at the systems in that country and trying to build the capacity for the systems in that country to operate so as to carry out investigations and prosecutions uh, to address the criminality, yes. So the other the other side of this is suppose I don't have complementarity. Um, just you know, with subtract that from the recipe. Um, what happens? But what, what's what's the the reverse side of all of that? If I don't have it, if I can't use it, if I can't make it happen. So if you don't have uh, the uh, competence locally to investigate or prosecute these uh, crimes. Uh, then for the countries where countries have ratified the Rome Statute, where the International Criminal Court has the jurisdiction to intervene, then an international body essentially comes in and does the work that the country itself was meant to do. In other countries that are not uh, parties to the Rome Statute, uh, sometimes the UN might step in. So, for example, uh, the UN exercising its Chapter 7 mandate, uh, that is the UN Security Council, may then set up a tribunal like they did with uh, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, um, which would do exactly the same thing that the ICC is doing, which is to investigate and prosecute uh, you know, crimes that have occurred. Uh, ICC may also apply even in countries that it's not a uh, party where countries are not parties to the Rome Statute. Uh, for example, if the UN Security Council refers those cases to the ICC, uh, as was done in Sudan, Sudan is not a uh, party to the Rome Statute, and Libya. Libya is also not party to the Rome Statute. Hmm. Hope, hope it is. Hope they are someday. 
someday soon. So what about yeah. Ukraine? You mentioned Ukraine was, uh, you know, within your uh, area. Um, it, how How is that different? How is the situation in Ukraine different? And the complementarity in Ukraine, how is that? How could that, how is that different? So in, in Ukraine, we're doing something, I think, which is uh, unique. Uh, we're looking at the crime of pillaging, uh, and how that has affected uh, the food system, food insecurity in the world. Um, and, and, and that's something that we're still, you know, in the preliminary phases of, we're trying to see how we can make the connection. Because sometimes, you know, people focus on uh, only the killings, uh, only the rapes, uh, and so on. Uh, and they forget that there are other serious crimes that have, you know, as much devastating consequences. You know, they're not obviously, I mean, of course, death is, uh, you know, is the worst. Um, uh, but when you have food insecurity uh, instigated by conflict or instigated by, you know, different personalities or actors uh, during a conflict and how that has, you know, gone global, and affected, you know, many countries, you now see, you know, spiraling uh, food uh, crisis or cost, you know, different uh, parts of the world. And, you know, some people essentially, you know, going hungry uh, as a result of this war uh, going on or conflict going on in Ukraine. Um, and so uh, sometimes uh, it's about, you know, collecting the right information and documenting the right set of things to be able to address different aspects. Uh, because one of the things that uh, international criminal justice seeks to do is to get the right, uh, the, the, the accurate records um, or reflection of what has happened uh, so that for posterity, so that people in future will understand. And, you know, so it's about documenting. Uh, you have people who uh, have, um, you know, like genocide memorials where they are able to go back in history to understand how it happened so as to prevent it. So never again. Uh, and never again means let's understand how this happened so that we can prevent it going forward. Um, you didn't mention um, taking children away. And I wonder if that's part of the, uh, the Ukraine effort. Because it seems to me that when you take a child away and you don't even keep a record of where the child is going, um, you are creating, you are doing a war crime and, and destroying families. Is that part of your investigation? It, it, yeah, it's not part of what Project Expedite Justice is doing, but um, I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of that going on. Um, and uh, it, it's important to bear in mind that there are many um, uh, organizations uh, essentially working in Ukraine trying to uh, develop uh, documentation capacity so that all these crimes are being documented as we speak uh, for a future accountability mechanism uh, that will we hopefully uh, will come on stream. Um, and and when we uh, project expedite justice uh, were looking into Ukraine, uh, we felt we needed to address something which was completely not being looked at, uh, and which had, um, and which we felt would also add value, um, you know, to the whole discourse, you know, in terms of the consequences of mass atrocities uh, and these sorts of crimes, and and the crime of pillaging, which is a very common crime uh, during mass conflicts. Uh, we felt this was a way of shining the spotlight so we can at least showcase to the world uh, the, the consequences um, that accompany this sort of crimes. Yeah, that's impressive because it's a very sophisticated analysis you have to make. Uh, yeah. It requires expertise in, in economics and distribution and in transportation, cargo handling, a, a lot of really sophisticated things, but it is totally valid claim as far as I'm concerned. Um, yes. The, the other, the other uh, thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, uh, you know, when, when, when all this arose and, and emerged as war crimes, and that's a long time ago already, it's a year ago, um, you know, we heard that a lot of people from 
various countries, I mean, outside of Africa, outside of Ukraine, were going into places where these war crimes were being investigated. Uh, and they were coming from Europe, they were coming from the US, and they were joining organizations. Uh, they were trying the best they could to help on the investigation and prosecution of, of war crimes and atrocities. So have you met them? Are they there? Are they there in the Horn of Africa? Are they there in Ukraine? And uh, where do they come from? Uh, are, are they American? Are they European? Are they a combination? Um, do you want more to come? Is it helpful to have them come? Um, so one of the things I think many people will tell you about what's uh, going on is that there are many uh, players uh, on the ground, and many of them actually uh, focusing on different aspects of uh, the conflict. You know, so some of them are focusing on uh, the killings. Some of them are focusing on uh, the aggression aspect of it. Uh, there's talk about, you know, in future there might be a a tribunal that is set up to address uh, the crime of aggression. Um, and, you know, it's too early to say whether they're helpful now. Um, of course, we hope uh, that they, they will be helpful. Um, I usually say that you know, this is the time to document the, the crimes going on because it's going to be very difficult in future uh, to do so. Now, because of technology also that we have, uh, you can document, uh, you know, using uh, systems that can preserve the evidence uh, for, you know, uh, future purposes. So this is an area that I, I, I believe uh, the, the world is watching and the people that are doing this sort of work were kind of like on trial. And I think it's, uh, it, it's a way in which we can prove that the work is useful and, and it's good for uh, for the global system as a whole. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, if they come from far away, they're willing to, um, you know, uh, contribute their time, volunteer, um, and take the risk, whatever that might be. That That's a, a statement, not only in terms of supporting you, but a statement back home. And they're telling the people back home, this is a worthy cause, and uh, we should all be involved and support this cause. Um, so um, good for you, and I really appreciate talking with you, Bodie. Um, and uh, I maybe hope they one one day I get to see you. How about that? One way, yeah, <laughs> that would be great, Jay. No, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. The pleasure here too, Bodie. Thank you so much. As we say, Thank aloha, you. aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.